the season. Uh, Sarah Rose back with us, a uh, proper long conversation. How are you getting on? Good, thanks for having me. How did it go? What was, um, like, there was loads of different parts that we kind of spoke to you about over the, the bit. It was like getting to grips with the new game, getting to grips with professionalism, um, living on the far side of the world. In retrospect, what was the hardest part of that? Probably getting to know the game and they are very big on their tactics and where you're meant to be at what time and it's really structured at times and I think you can get nearly too caught up in that and you're afraid to go somewhere because you're afraid to be in the wrong position and I think the first two or three games I was probably doing exactly what I was told to do and then I kind of said to myself, I think just see the ball, get the ball and make it a bit more simple for myself. And once I did that, I started to um, come into a bit of form. So um, I think sometimes you can overcomplicate the game and overcomplicate the structures. Yeah, and I guess they're probably giving you very fixed things to do because it's new to you. And that's good for the first two weeks. But after that, you're like, well, I mean, you didn't sign me here just to do the things you tell me to do, right? Yeah, and I think I kind of understood the game then and I was like, I can kind of back myself on the, my decisions to make, that I was going to make on the pitch. And um, I think it was just as once I got confident with my skills and all that, all the rest of it just followed. How much did you know about Aussie rules? Mm, very little. Yeah, OK, so <laughs> a, a, a lot of us don't. I, I'm going to yeah. confess that I'm, I'm in a fairly similar boat. So. What position were you playing? What was the so job? I was playing like a half forward role. So my role as such, I suppose, was when the ball went over my head into the taller forwards, I needed to be the person to crumb the ball and get in underneath it. Um, and so the way it worked, I suppose, was um, I had to get up and down the ground. It was the most um, taxing role, I suppose, on your body. What's crumb the ball? Crumb the ball. So crumb the ball is get really low as soon as the ball hits. So if a tall forward hits the ball down, as soon as it hits the ground, I need to get in, get in under it. So okay. I need to be front and centre of my player every time the ball was going into the inside forward line. Because that gives you a mark? Yeah, so, no. no. So uh, clean. So it's more so up to the inside forwards to mark the ball. Right. I can mark the ball around the midfield area, but if the ball goes in high, it's their job to mark the ball high. And as soon as, if they can't mark the ball, they tap it down and I should be there to collect it. And at that point, to score off that? Yeah, yeah, to try one. score off it, I suppose, yeah, but um, the easiest way really to score is if you mark the ball and um, then take your shot. Here. Collingwood have dug deep in the second okay. term and turned it around as Lambert goes short and finds Rowe. Here we go. So I hit up short balls like time. that. She'll kick from 40 metres Jesus. out directly in front. Uh, you take it out that far Waste to give yourself... Time. You have to do like a 20 meter run off, it's crazy. Very close to pound on the mark. That chipping style, up and under. Dangerous, Shevlin at the front just couldn't quite control it. See, Coming the other way, Jess Highs. There. He should have, she should have been in road. underneath it. Right. Seconds left. And that's you there doing the same thing. Is that, is that defensive here? Oh, no. This okay. is me in the forward line, but she tackled me at the neck, the so I got a free in front of goal. And Sarah Rowe um, have a chance to go back and kick a first How long is the game? Sixty to seventy minutes. Right. Ten minutes lead. stoppages. And in Sarah terms of the running, um, really probably do up to maybe 11, 12k a game. Which would be a bit more than... A bit more than, well, especially because I suppose I play full forward at home, but playing a half forward role, yeah. Can you, more. can you prepare for that before you go over? I mean, are you just like uh, running laps, keeping your fitness up before you actually make the trip down? Yeah, I was did an awful lot of work um, on my fitness six weeks before I came out because I knew I was going into a professional environment. I'd be training some days twice a day, so I did prepare myself for that big time and focused really hard six weeks before I came out. And is it a massive step up when it comes to the sports science and to endurance work over there? Definitely endurance work it is, yeah, it's a massive part of it, um, but in terms of the speed and the pace of the game, I think you do a lot more endurance running, not as much um, fast off the mark stuff. So, so you're a playmaker gonna... here as well? So yeah, half forward roll I suppose. Brisbane will not play finals in 2000. Alright, you're not the man. Happy days. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, always good to spoil someone's party. Yeah, how many, absolutely. How many games did you win? Oh, that's the question I didn't want you to ask. So we actually only won one game. Right. Um, we have a very young team. We got rid of 12 players last year and um, got in a really young bunch of girls. So we had, I think, 
15, 16 girls under the age of 22. Okay. So we didn't have that much experience. Um, but we had a really, I suppose we had a really good background team and we had a really good team morale and I would predict that the future will be bright for the club. But it did definitely seemed like um, when you were kicking that yeah, and in the third quarter there and that one that like that everybody was getting on, they were seemed pretty happy. Yeah, like I suppose it came to the stage where we celebrated all the small wins and um, while we were a losing team, we had a really good um, team culture and I suppose that goes a long way and I think it's hard to create that when you're, especially when you're losing, it's easy to create that when you're winning games. So I think that was very important for us. Um, are you going back? I um, haven't made my decision yet, but the um, decision has to be made very soon because the signing period is um, the last day is the 15th of April. All oh, right, that's really quick. It's very quick, yeah. So um, they're proposing, they propose like two year contracts or whatever, but um, that would be a big decision for me. So if I was to, I would, I would take one year at a time. Yeah. What are your teammates doing at the moment? Are they all kind of gone back home, not doing anything at the moment? No, so they play VFL, so right. it's kind of like club football. They all play for, this, for Collingwood and they play that from now until the end of August. So ideally, I would play that and get more experience and get game time. But um, Presumably that would happen if you signed a two-year contract. Yeah, see that would, it, it would do a lot for my game. It would be really helpful and... Um, you definitely gain a lot of confidence from them games, but um, no, I have to get back into the green and red. Because ultimately, it's a no-brainer when you have that opportunity when you can come back and get into the business end of Mayo season. But ultimately, a two-year contract, it becomes an either-or call, doesn't it? Yeah, 100%. It completely changes things. And, you know, one way you think, oh, playing professional is unbelievable and being in that environment to have them unbelievable facilities, people around you. I sat in the gym one day and looked around me, there's offices of people around you who just want to help you to be a better athlete, which I suppose I found amazing and I made use of every person in the club um, to make me a better athlete. But um, I loved that side of it. I loved um, the way they looked after you and the facilities and all that part. But um, I suppose it pulls on your heartstrings a bit. You have that loyalty towards GA and I don't know if that'll ever leave me. Mm. When you talk about all those different people who are there in the club to help you, is there a particular person or a particular area that you were leaning on more than others? So we actually interlinked a lot with the men's and also there's a netball team there as well so we interlinked with the netball team as well because every sport can learn from every sport. So the men's coaches would come to our trainings and they'd watch uh, bef um, before the matches and after the matches and the way we conduct ourselves and we do the same with the men's and we'd see could we learn anything off their setup and could they learn anything off ours and same with the netballers and then on my days off which were Tuesdays and Thursdays and um, the men's coaches took me for an hour and a half two hour ses skill sessions and that was absolutely invaluable to me and I suppose they gave me a different edge to a different voice as well and um, so I've that was one part I absolutely loved as well. That's literally something that should be copied all around the world. Like Mayo, for example, GA teams could easily just take that model of taking the knowledge that they have in men's setups and applying them to the women's setups. Yeah, hundred percent. Like I think that Mayo and any club team, they sh or county team, that it should be, you know, one county, one voice, one vision. So I think that's what Collingwood really do implement. And we had a um, obviously a session with the men's team as well, and. That means you get to know the lads around the gym and you can have a chat and I suppose Mason Cox is one of the big players who came over from America and wasn't making it for years and he was a good fella to chat to in the gym and say look you know there's days where you're going to have bad days like stick at it and make sure to listen to people around you but don't listen to too many people because you have everyone trying to help you out there as well. So I found two or three people that I could really connect with and really understand and one of the men's coaches in particular, um, he was a former player and he was just unbelievable at what he did and a brilliant coach, so I learned a lot from him. It's really interesting, like I mean, the, when you talk about integration, like Amy Lawrence had a great piece in The Guardian this week about how the Arsenal Academy are looking to keep boys and girls together until a later age, which you'd imagine will have huge benefits. Oh, 100%. When I played soccer as well, I we had no team. I had no team to train with at home because um, it was the time of year that it was. And um, Dave Connell, my coach at the time, made me go up and train with the uh, boys team. That was at the age of eighteen or nineteen, and that was the best thing for me. Like my touch just improved so much. So I think definitely interlinking the boys and girls more would um, be a serious benefit. And um, also with Mayo a few years ago, we used to have challenge games games against boys teams and also just made us that bit sharper, that bit quicker. Mm. Yeah, so there's the the picture of the Amy Lawrence piece. It's the it's under twelve is what 
that at that stage it's the two best under 12s are playing with the very best Arsenal under 12s and holding their own winning the shuttle sprints and also just getting better but I mean it seems like we're a bit away from that in a lot of sports in Ireland where everything is like under sixes separate under eight separate when you can it doesn't make any sense to me yeah definitely not I think when no matter where you go and into what environment it is in sports you either sink or swim so if the standard is higher you know that you need to get better you work harder and you eventually get to that level so it would only bring on the standard of the game I think it would be a great idea to keep boys and girls together as long as possible What if you were to win an all Ireland with Mayo this year would that free you up to go off and say okay I'm done here now <laughs> In one way but unfortunately I miss out on all the celebrations then. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I suppose I have to have my decision made before then but um, yeah if I won an All-Ireland with Mayo I think no matter what you'll always want more and um, you'll never be satisfied with just one so um, once you get one you want more. Yeah okay so um, just to some breaking news that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer has apparently been confirmed <laughs> as the uh, manager of Manchester United it seems that Gary Neville knew something was coming or has sparked Manchester United into some activity or also they were just waiting for all the journalists to arrive back from the uh, international trip and now everybody's back on Premier League duty and they're all going to start reporting that instead. Uh, we'll talk to Andy Mitten in a couple of minutes time. Um, I do want to talk to you about the Taylor Harris image which obviously went global, went viral. So um, here's the picture that everybody has seen at this stage which is now imprinted on a bunch of t-shirts and selling really well. Um, what, what did you make of this whole story? Um, I think Channel 7 were the ones who made the big mistake um, by actually deleting the post and kind of giving in to all the trolls. But um, it's something that we're not really used to of, for women's sport over here in Ireland of you know negative press because at the moment you're trying to promote the game so it's all positive feedback and um, I think there's a lot of that there is a lot of that in Australia and is there, uh, yeah yeah like Twitter would be hopping after games um, you know with good and bad obviously majority good but lots of bad too and um, so I think Taylor and a few girls from my club as well they all stood up against it and said that they weren't given into the into the trolls and that it wasn't good enough and um, so yeah I think um, I think it's it's great. I think it's great how much people stood up behind her and um, rolled in behind her, and it just shows where the game is going. Uh, is that something that you guys have to talk about? That there will inevitably be stuff on social media because we talk about this a good bit actually. And there's no real training campaign. There's no real kind of integrated societal approach to this, and it, it's something that sports people seem to get a lot more than any other walk of life. Like you know. If you're in the public eye, people wrongly believe that they have a right to comment on whatever it is. Um, is that something that your team was ready for? Is that something you talked about? Is that something that there was a strategy to deal with? Yeah, we there's like a media department in Collingwood and they speak to you about, I suppose, the way you firstly conduct yourself on social media is um, really important and they monitor that heavily. And um, they say, you know, there's certain things that you could put up on your social media that could leave you open for stuff like that. And that's your fault then in that case. But um, they prepare you as as best as they can and they obviously say to us after games like don't go on Twitter or remove yourself off that app if you feel like you're getting any hate and um, also there's always a psychologist to talk to about it but um, normally it's you know it's people who just you know keyboard warriors for me I wouldn't take it too personally I kind of I know I know what they're about and any normal person really wouldn't be commenting on too much. Yeah I just want to play you this it's Kieran Donaghy on the shot clock from last week talking about how we have to get harder on the trolls have a look. Absolutely, yeah. Tell you, Harris, unbelievable photo, serious athleticism. I have two daughters, Jeremy, if they're going to go on and play football or basketball at any code, and the relative body is going to put up a picture of them in action. As you said, if these dickheads are going to come in with this kind of stuff, it's, it's, it's reckless. And, and us as, as, as men and, and people in general have to start calling out these people. And, you know, like these, these people, like, like, you know, we have inter-county players, the soccer players, they've been bullied online on a regular basis, you know, like we can have opinions on people, but these people that go online, these trolls that go on and put up this stuff, actually put it out there on their feed uh, and, you know, everybody else lets them away with it instead of calling them out and saying, hey man, you're way overboard there. You know, I think we need to get a bit harder on the trolls. The start of uh, a general awakening around this. Um, what's the crack with Mayo at the moment? What's the level of expectation heading into the season? Because obviously there was um, fairly pronounced public difficulties last year. 
yeah, it's um, it's actually been going really well, and we're definitely building for the future. And we're kind of just taking one game at a time and taking it, I suppose, every training at a time. But there's a lot of young girls in there, and for me, walking back into a team, you know, sometimes that can be hard. Um, but I walked back in, and I just felt just as a part of it as everyone else did. And there's a really good vibe around the place, and I think that's really important after everything uh, we went through last year. Was getting away from it and going out to Australia kind of a, a blessing in that way to get away from that physically as, as well as mentally, I guess? Yeah, in one way it was and I switched my focus completely and just kind of before I went out, focused on me and and then got out there and had a completely different focus. But I kept in contact with Peter all the time. I was ringing the girls once a week. I was in contact with Neve Kelly all the time and just let, let me know, like keeping me in the loop, I suppose. And um, I think, yeah, I've come back definitely with a refreshed head and a different outlook. So um, hopefully I can bring something to the team. Are you coming back as a different player? Um, I don't know. I suppose potentially uh, maybe more of an endurance runner. Than well, if you've added all that, like it would be a good idea to use it. Or are you like, no, screw this. I'm full forward line. No, no. I'm happy. I'm happy wherever he wants me to play. I'm happy to play wherever. And I suppose the girls have worked really hard. So it's going to take me time as well to break into that team because the, like the forward line is probably the strongest point in, in our Mayo team, so um, I'm happy to play wherever. As long as I'm on the pitch, I'll be happy. Could you play midfield, for example? Could you be a runner, like a running midfielder now, burning yeah. people off over a course of a game? I, I wouldn't mind. Um, as, at underage level, I played um, wing back and I played centre half back, I played midfield, so I've, I've played it all before, so um, I'd be very much so open to a suggestion there. And in terms of the style of play, has that evolved over the last couple of years? Like. Um, like, what, what, how, how do Mayo like to play now? What, when you've come back this year? I think it's a very attacking team. Um, I think there's, um, they're a big running team as well. Um, with you know Grace Kelly, Neve Kelly, Sinead Calf, all extremely fit girls. Um, get up and down the ground and, um, open play kind of play, see what you play, and not too much tactics involved. It's just um, go out and play. How good are the Dublin team at the moment? Have they maintained their form from last year? Yeah, very good. Um, I think you see Mick Bowen using 35 different players in uh, throughout the league. I think Peter adopted a similar style last year where he changed up the league team every every single match. And um, I think that's really important to develop girls and develop confidence. The only way you're going to get better is if you play games. And um, Mick Bowen's obviously done that. And some of his big stars um, have only played two or three league games, which I think is um, really good for the other girls to see that if they work hard, they'll get a chance on the team and it's the same with Mayo and that's what Peter's adapted over the last year or two and I think it's the only way is up when you do that. Who else are the challenges going to be this year to the Dubs crown? Dublin, um, Galway, very strong team, I have unbelievable underage structures, probably haven't, probably have underachieved over the last few years. Um, Donegal I suppose and Cork. So some of the usual suspects and then some rising forces as well. Yeah. well. Sarah, welcome home. Thanks very much for joining us today and uh, congratulations and um, you know, best of luck with the decision. It's always good to have decisions. The last time you were here you had the decision to go and play soccer in the States or uh, yeah. AFL or uh, stick with Mayo. So, you know, it's nice to be wanted, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly.